Hello everyone, welcome to the first APJ friendly episode of Create a Toolbox. My name is Pranav Bhagat and I am a senior developer advocate here in India and I'll pass it to Earl. Hi everyone, my name is Earl Duque. I'm a developer advocate with ServiceNow and I'm located in the States. So it is uh, 1 a.m. for myself in Pacific time zone, but I'm happy to join. Uh, thanks all for joining at this late hour. So we'll be, we'll be your host for today's episode on Creative Toolbox on RPA. For those of you who don't know about Creative Toolbox, this is where we showcase some of the new features, either by ourselves or we invite guests for, from our product team to show us these new features. We have a lot more content available on our developer program channel. So make sure you go ahead and check out our ServiceNow Developer Program channel at devlink.sn slash YouTube. And speaking about the channel, we know that many of you enjoy our content, but according to YouTube stats, uh, according to YouTube stats, like we, uh, we see that a lot of you haven't subscribed to our channel. So make sure you click on the subscribe button, like the video and press the bell icon. Now, I think you are able to see that. Now, without further ado, let me introduce you to today's guest, Daniel. And uh, let me just add. Hi, Daniel. Hey, Pranav. Good to see you. How are you doing today? Thank you. I'm doing splendid. Glad, glad to be back on the show here. Perfect. So, stage is all yours, Daniel. Like, we'd love to see what you have for us. All right, thanks a lot. So you invited me to today to talk about RPA and what we have new in Utah for RPA, right? So very quickly, who am I? My name is Daniel Dres. As you just said, I am a product success manager at ServiceNow covering automation engine, app engine, and part of that is RPA Hub. And today, the next, what's that? Probably 50 minutes, 40 minutes, something like that. We'll talk about new things, new features, and I will demo some of the new features of RPA Hub in Utah. Um, so there are a few features uh, that I that we are especially proud of that we're going to do some demo, right? And I think they will be really exciting to see. But first off, as we don't know the audience here and, and, and kind of the knowledge, I want to start off with giving a quick intro and overview of what is automation engine. Why do we have it? What, how does RPA fit into that overall picture? Right? So when we talk about automation in today's world, right? We, we have automations basically everywhere, anywhere in, 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 in modern life, uh, our employees, our people are exposed to automated things. And that starts off with traditional things like a software request. I think it has been probably years since anybody of you had to ask IT to install a software on their device, right? That is automated since a long time already for most people. But a lot of other things have made dramatic changes over the last years, like digital payments, right? Would you have imagined paying bills from your mobile phone a few years ago? Device changes, you're rebooting devices, you do stuff, everything has, a lot of things have been automated. And I think one of the high, uh, or high visibility th things in terms of automation that everybody knows us is Amazon as a big store, right? You order something from them and you have actually no idea who's shipping it from where it's being shipped and it just magically flows and works. That's the whole notion of making complicated process seamlessly easy to people to access it, to have them available. And that's kind of the um, whole notion of what we call hyper automation. But underneath the bonnet, behind the scenes, Typically, it's not that easy, especially in enterprises these days. There are a lot of disconnected systems that are in enterprises, like you have your ERP, your HR, your CRM, your IT system, all these different tool sets out there. They create islands, and these islands are difficult to automate, especially across from one island to another, right? So they are somehow isolated. And the same, same thing goes true for your automation tools, then, right? There are different needs that you need to automate stuff, right? You might have integrations, we have RPA things. So there are different disciplines you need to make really end-to-end -end automation across these different critical systems. And, and that makes it even more complicated, right? That leaves your employees quite often with uninspiring human work, swivel sharing, copy-pasting stuff from one system to another, which is not really 
happy work, right? You don't, we don't, we all like, we all don't like to do that. Right. And it's also error prone. If you're humans copying, pasting stuff, we, we make mistakes here and there, right? It is also a big cost in terms of work time. A lot of time gets used by these mundane tasks. And that's where the whole notion of hyper automation comes in. And in today's world, if we, if we look basically in, in, in the ecosystem around the world, there's a lot of different tool sets around there to cover these different aspects. As I mentioned, you, you have different needs. Like if you talk on the bottom right here, where it says integration, there's lots of different tools you can use to integrate A to B, if this, then that, Tipco, Boomi, Zapier, whatever, right? There are lots of different tools that can do integrations. Almost none of them can do an RPA, right? If you talk about robotic process automation, it's a different set of tools. And that goes on for AI or process flow. So there's a plethora of different tools that you need to kind of get together. It's a pretty fragmented landscape out there. And we believe at ServiceNow, we're the only platform that offers all these different categories on one platform. That has been our promise since years, right? Single data model, single platform. And we hold true to that even though in, in, in this automation landscape. So we have embedded RPA as a native capability into the now platform as part of Automation Engine. Automation Engine has other features as well, right? So we have, uh, if you start here in the center, the integration hub, something been out for a couple of years, and I hope you all have been using it in one way or another to building integrations on based on APIs connecting two systems. We have on the right hand side added about a year ago document intelligence, which helps in intelligently parsing and reading PDF files, getting content out of that PDF files, uh, maybe like invoices, right? Getting the dates, the totals, the cost, and these kind of things uh, in an AI driven, very easy uh, to set up manner. And what we're focusing today is the left hand part of that slide is RPA Hub, where we use robotic processing automation, basically. You could see it's kind of a macro, right? We, we are kind of auto replaying things that a user would naturally be do, copy and pasting values, entering data in forms and things like that, really on screen, right? So anything that does not have an API can typically be done using an RPA technology. And all that comes under the umbrella of automation engine. And we say connect anything to anything or to service now, basically. Now, a high level overview of what we have in there, we said, yeah, um, integration hub, anything API led, we have more than 175, I think 180, whatever different spokes to connect to any third party system you more or less can imagine, you can create your own spokes, everything API led should be based on integration hub, RPI, RPA, anything UI led, anything that you run on a user interface that runs on a machine and needs to click stuff, the document part as mentioned for extracting information out of PDF files. Automation center to give you a nice overview of what kind of automations you actually have. What's the return of invest for your investment into these hyper automation technologies. And lastly, we added just with Utah stream connect for Apache Kafka. So for is high volume transaction sending data in and out to service. Now we can now offer a Kafka integration there as well. That's kind of the high level overview of automation engine. I'm sure if you have some specific questions, uh, you can we can dive into that or we can get your sales team to act on that. The focus for today is that RPA hub tile corner there in there. Um, I wanted to play a quick video. Um, it's really just three minutes. I, I know it's kind of uninspiring to get to a live session and watch a video, but this is really a great <laughs> video <laughs> of, of showing what is our marketing message, what is our positioning for RPA? Without further ado, just let me roll that video and then we get, I'll promise, into live world and I'm going to demo features. Acme Inc. has recently established a formal partnership with one of their key suppliers, VendorCo, in order to optimize the way they jointly meet the needs of their customers. To kick off this new partnership, the two businesses need to navigate the initial agreement and documentation phase, hold a kickoff workshop to commence planning, and establish technical linkages between their key information systems. For many of the Acme Inc. employees, this kickoff will be their first time in the corporate offices, which means they need to obtain an ID badge. Similarly, the guests coming from VendorCo will need temporary badging to ensure they can access the necessary facilities. 
Acme Inc. uses a legacy badging application built in the Java.NET framework, which, unfortunately, doesn't have any API access. This tool requires the lobby ambassador to manually confirm and transfer employee information from their directory to the badging tool. When a guest arrives, the lobby ambassador performs a similar process, but also has to confirm with the guest sponsor. Normally, this doesn't present an issue, as the lobby ambassador can handle a few guests at a time, but with such a large influx of guests coming on such short notice, it's pivotal that the access and authorization process be as automated and accurate as possible. Robotic process automation solves this problem with ease, enabling sophisticated workflow automation that connects with this legacy tool, eliminating the need for manual, repetitive work. The beauty of this solution is that all the automation is unified on a single platform and is using Flow Designer as well. Using the ServiceNow platform, employees can use the service catalog within Employee Center to request that badges be available for them at the location and time of their choice. The service catalog can also be used by the kickoff coordinator to proactively request guest badges. These requests will then trigger a flow in Flow Designer that automatically interface with the badging system using an RPA robot, or what we call a digital worker, while simultaneously keeping interested parties informed. Once triggered, the RPA robot springs into action, equipped with the data flowing from the ServiceNow request. It will first log into the badging app with appropriate permissions, select the appropriate badge type, enter the necessary details, and determine the completion state so that it can send that status back to the ServiceNow instance. As you can see, not only is this automation massively faster, it also provides greater accuracy and traceability. Back in the ServiceNow instance, admins have full visibility to the activities of the RPA robots. RPA Hub serves as the central management interface through which admins can build, administer, and monitor their RPA activities. Admins can manage the lifecycle of their RPA automation, package them for distribution, manage their plugin library, and more. Another great feature of RPA Hub is the ability to track business application dependencies so that your organization can tactfully manage upgrades to applications involved with your automation. The RPA Hub spoke is a native component of Flow Designer, so you can incorporate robotic process automation in nearly any process or workflow. This flexibility allows you to create truly complete automation that can integrate via API with modern systems using Integration Hub's out-of-the-box spokes or via tight coupling using RPA all orchestrated on a modern, intuitive, low-code platform. With this badge generation automation in place, the lobby ambassador can focus on what they do best, and the attendees can rest assured their kickoff will start on time. Awesome. So I promised it was short. I hope that was OK for Acme everyone. Inc. No, not again. That one. <laughs> so. <laughs> so. Now it's time to get some real meat on the bone here for RPA Hub. What did we do in Utah? Right? RPA Hub has been released two releases ago. If we call back, it's Utah, Tokyo, San Diego, right? San Diego early on last year, March last year, something like that. We released RPA Hub first time to customers. Now with Utah, it's kind of our third release, if you want to put it that way. And we have added some significant enhancement here. Um, if, if we take that in three kind of buckets, uh, first one is an RPA Hub itself. We have some key capabilities added here, like a robot calendar. I will show that in, in the demo in, in just a, a few moments uh, and explain more on that. The intention is that you can sh visually show when your robot is doing what kind of action. And that's really important as you plan out and, and want to utilize your robots to the maximum. We have, and I will talk about that as well, reparented quite a lot of tables and information in RPA Hub to allow the information to be actually transferred using update sets. That's something San Diego and Tokyo couldn't do That's or right. didn't do. There's a lot of manual steps you have to do to get from dev to test to prod and deploy all the RPA components. And we have heard your feedback, listened to that, and changed the way it works. That is a quite important piece to add. We also added a feature to work queue. So when you have a set of queues of items that a robot needs to work on, and for some reason, maybe some of them fail or one of them fails, we added an automatic retry feature where you now can configure like a retry for three times until you run into error or report an error, things like that. You could do that before manually, but we have added that as a native capability into our platform. Awesome. And cool. then the big block is the desktop design studio. That's the studio you use to create these automations to do your robots. And we'll always spend some time in that as well in, in just a few minutes. 
uh, we have added a universal app connector, which is pretty nice feature as when you're working with different applications on a Windows desktop, Chrome, Edge, Windows applications, all these had different connectors in the past, work very similarly, but still a bit different. Now we have a universal app connector that works with all hmm. of them. And with that universal app connector, the biggest thing we have is our universal recorder. We can now record as you click through your process and basically get your shell ready for the robot. So you don't need to do everything manually. And I'll, I'll spend some time in doing a recording. Nice. Um, what else did we add? Some other improvements. Um, very important one with Utah. RPA Hub is available on personal developer instances, as we hear in the developer's corner. I think Yay. that's a big one. <laughs> and all the demo you will see today is actually on a PDI, right? I just registered a PDI, I think Friday, and get that up all and running. All you need to do, go into the plugins, act activate RPA Hub, and everything is there. You can start using RPA on PDIs. Does it still take four hours or more <laughs> to well, activate? I didn't watch it. I started it, went to sleep and came back and it was there. That's, that's the right way to do it. That's the right way to do it for everyone watching. But I think, yes, indeed, it, it took a while. I don't I did, don't recall how long, but yes, it did take a while to actually do that. <laughs> it's a big plugin. <laughs> it, it is quite a huge plugin, indeed, indeed. Um, we also added multi-factor authentication options. So if your robot will need to log in into a third-party system requiring multi-factor authentication, we have now native support for that as well for the most common uh, one-time password providers like Google Authenticator and, and, and Okta and things like that. And then some minor stuff, yeah, flow designer actions and, and trigger source, that, that's some minor things. I will spend today time on the universal connector and recorder, the robot calendar, and the reparenting. That's the four things I want to put out and, and, and get you guys educated or speed up to use these new features. If you have any questions, please type in. I'm sure uh, Earl and Pranav are watching the chat as I speak and, and look at the slides here. First, and probably most exciting feature, Universal App Connector and Recorder. I mentioned it briefly. So if you look at that little architecture slide on the right-hand side, you see that on the bottom side, we have different applications like Windows applications, Java, Chrome, Edge, Firefox, all these different applications. They obviously have a different way of communicating for the robot, how we can find elements on the screen and click them and stuff. So we have connectors for all of them, and we did have them in the past as well in San Diego and Tokyo. But we now, what we now added is that yellow bar on top, that universal app connector, which kind of front faces these connectors. So you don't see all the difference. We still have that underneath in our bonnet or in our belly somewhere, but we have that front facing universal app connector that makes life a lot easier for you as you work through. And I'll, I'll go through a demo. And on top of that universal app connector, we have our recorder that can record actions. Um, yeah, let's get into a demo first. Uh, now I need to find a way back to my demo screen uh, and I'll need to Switch my screen share here for a moment. Let me get that ordered. Universal Recorder excites me so much because my first diving into automation was recording macros on Excel. So it's like, <laughs> oh, now we have it in RPA. So it's even more, more people can get into it because it's so easy to record your own stuff. And also like when I was working on a different automation system, and I saw that feature, I was really fascinated. And when service announced it, I was like, man, this is a game changer for sure. We don't have those separate, separate components on your RPA. It's like one component you use to record everything. So that's absolutely right. And, and, and to fairly admit, yes, other comp competitors in the market, they did have a recorder already in the past versus we had to catch up here. But now we have it. And we also see that recorder as a option to hand out these recording step tasks to a business user, right? They know what they're doing. So they can actually use that recorder in kind of a low code, actually no code fashion and get you the shell of what they want to do. And you, you as an RPA developer have only to build a robot around that. So to demo that recorder, what I want to do today, this is my virtual machine here. Um, what I wanted to do, some of you might know this web page called RPA Challenge. It is basically, if you have a robot and you want to 
learn how the robot works. The intention here is you download an Excel file, has a couple of rows, you click on start and based from the Excel file, you start populating data into here. The tricky part here is the, the, the fields on the screen, they change their location every time you reload, reload the page. Like if you look oh, here, currently address is on the top left. If I refresh that page, now role is on the top left. Right? So your robot needs to be a bit smart to figure out where is the field I actually want to put some stuff in here, right? <laughs> that's a, the that's a tricky part in, in, in that robot. So I started to not build the whole robot today, right? Um, in having a robot almost ready. In a essence, I'm just loading that project here. So I, I'm I'm ready. When we can see that, come on, activities, main, load up. Um, I'm opening the Excel file, I'm parsing the Excel file, and I'm at the loop point where I could enter data into the web page. But I have not yet done anything with the web page. Uh, that is blank. The only thing I had is that Excel. I also see here in global objects, we only have the Excel in here, nothing else. So what I want to do now in the next probably five, maybe 10 minutes is recording the steps on the browser, embed them here in my automation and let the whole thing run. So coming to the universe, to the recorder, universal recorder, the new button is up here in the toolbox called launch recorder. Easy, right? Well, okay. let's click on that. Very Studio disappears. And on the right hand side, we get this little overlay pop up from our recorder. We can start recording. We can see a list of recorder steps, which surprisingly is empty for the time being. Uh, can close that again. We can get to help and we can close and exit. So let's start recording. I start recording and I start just move my mouse over the screens. So I want to actually record and everything works. Sometimes it just takes a few seconds to realize I'm here. Maybe reload the page one more time. Oh, yeah, there we go. It just started up working. You can see it's starting highlighting elements on the screen and with red circles or red rectangles and gives some some option here. Like I can navigate up in the DOM tree like we did with the capture element before. So if you worked with the stuff before, you can move up to different fields so to find which element you actually want. Or you can go to that green box saying, what do you want to do here? We can do set a text, we can click, we set key. So it's trying to be smart in, in what element it's currently highlighting and what you can do with that element. So what I want to do, as simple as that, I want to actually set text on this one and say, this is an email field. So I'll, whatever I type in here now will be set into that text box. I'm typing the name of the field so I can find it in my robot easier, right? Because we will see that in a moment. It, will record the fields as like text one, two, three, four, five, which might make it a bit difficult. But I, I take, I name it now email, just press enter and it's executing and it's re recording that action. If I now look into my recorder steps, we can see it says we set a text on a field. That's great. Well, let's continue and do the other ones. Last name, set text, and again, last name, return, get to phone number. It's very straightforward. That's pretty slick, isn't it? Phone number. Another one, first name. It's just a few more fields. I'm almost there. First name. Address. Okay. I probably hit the wrong element. Come on, yeah. Make sure we get on the right element here. Okay. Okay, let's try the next one. Ah, yeah, I see it. You can see the tag it's currently highlighting. It's that, what's that? Angular brackets, how do you call it? I don't know. Carrots. If I move up, I should get to the right element. No, diff, come on, get highlight the right element. Oh, now they look the same. Okay, let's try. Set text, company name, record. Action was added to the list. So it did add it for whatever. It just couldn't get the stuff in there. Okay. We'll test it out as we get in and we'll see. Yeah, role works. And then we, if we get to the button, you see it's trying to be smart and saying, hey, this one you probably want to click because it is a button, not a text field. So let's click that. On click, the page reloads and the fields reorder. That's fine. We don't need that for now. Let's stop recording. And we see all the elements it has recorded. Now it is, I need to save that recording and getting it back into my automation. I just say save recording and it's asking me, hey, I will create a new activity for you. What do you want in that activity to be named? Enter data to form. It's 
can create a new global object or an existing one. I don't have one, so we'll make a new global object, call it RPA challenge website. Save recording. Takes a moment or two, still stores the stuff into Studio and brings you back to Studio. And if I go now here, we can see it has added a connector, the universal connector. It found the website, RPA challenge. And it has all the components. And that's what I meant with, I, they are all named one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. It's a bit difficult to know which ones they are. But it also added here a new activity called enter data to form. And if and I open built that the whole thing for you too. That's and awesome. it built the whole flow for me, right? It put a wait for create there. So it knows about good practices kind of. It makes a decision if it's really loaded. And it start entering set text, 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 and goes through all these different elements, right? And that's where I can now see which field is which email, last name, phone, first name. So I know exactly where I am, right? I can rename the fields now. They let's say go this one. That's the first one. It has no name, so let's give it a name. That would be an email, actually. Double click. No, that's the wrong one. Email. There we go. Now it's renamed email, so I can rename all these fields. So it makes it a bit easier for me to navigate my bot last name. Oops, almost. <laughs> <laughs> then two would be phone. Get in here and I'll do that. You'll see that in a moment. So it's easier for me to link them up what they are. Phone and we have three is first name. So that's some uh, housekeeping or cleanup you have to do after recording. And I bet we're working on it to make it a bit smarter to figure out what it actually is instead of one, two, three, four, five. But you probably get rid of one of those set fours because it did address twice. I did address twice. Uh, yeah, because actually. You, you, yeah, when you were recording it, yeah, yeah. Um, because you thought it was an error, but it did uh, record yeah. it anyways. We, see, yeah, we, yeah, we yeah. did it twice. Okay. Yeah. That's true. Take it off. That's good. Delete that one. That's good. Good catch. And we have the six one is company, seven is role, role. So now we got them all. We got the nice names for them and we get a submit button. I told you the elements on screen move around. So let's see what the recorder actually captured. If I go into configure, the configure dialog is similar as the before, not exactly the same. You can see we have now a selection of what kind of application you want to look for and stuff like that. But everything else is pretty much the same. So we have here our RPA challenge website, which is URL equals this, index equals that. Usually you take off the index as part of the training. And if I do like here a fresh screen and elements, two of them turn green, the others don't. And the reason behind that is the page has reloaded. And I told you the screen, the element move on screen, right? So it's mm -hmm. not at the same place and says, well, I, I don't know how to find it. The recorder will try again, a kind of a guess of what how, how it's the best approach to identify elements. I know for this specific website, it's easier to actually go by tag name and tell them we go by the labels. There's an NG reflect label. If I put that one here and say refresh, come on, refresh, it turns green, it finds it. So all, all I need to do is basically say, well, actually the way you found it doesn't work. We'll use a different one. Go through all of these elements quickly and do that. Anyone that has played with RPA before in ServiceNow will recognize this process of finding all the tags and CSS identifiers. Yeah. It's always a bit kind of, especially with websites, you kind of need to well, need to know it, but you need to understand how the website, website has been crafted to find the elements appropriately. And this one, I said, they particularly made it a bit difficult as the fields move. Now I told him, don't look for the CSS, just look for an input tag with an attribute of this name, and that will find all the elements. Yay, so they are all there, we are good, done. So what I could do right now is I could run that with these hard-coded text that we had before and see it populate the fields on screen. Let's try that. Let's move this out of the way here. Uh, organize my screen a little bit. And let's run from here. Run from here and it should start populating stuff. There you go. You see that? It was quick, right? But data was in there and it clicked on and then And then press the submit, submit button so we couldn't watch it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we can actually, if you want to do that one more time, just instead of that, put a breakpoint here. It might be helpful for people to know. So that way we stop right there and we just run it one more time. One more time. And a good demonstration of it working on a different organized yeah. form. Exactly. That's the awesome. form has reordered and you still address, address companies. So we all found the right fields. It's all there where we want it. That's awesome. Now let's wire that up with the Excel part. That's great. Just... That's what, only 10 minutes within the universal recorder to get that going? 
That's awesome. was fast, right? Recorder, do some cleanup of what it had recorded, and you're pretty much done. All we need to do now to wire up is basically get the Excel information in here. Um, I know it's seven fields, so we take seven inputs. Seven. We could name them appropriately. So let me see. What do we have? Email. Oops. When I first heard about it, it was like uh, I never thought it would be this easy. It can be really easy, and that is one of the great features of RPA. You can build an automation really fast. To get it to a productive setup, let's say, where you really run it somewhere in the background in a data center completely unattended, it probably still takes a bit of extra time to put some resilience into it, right? Websites change, Windows machines get updates and stuff. So put in some error handling. What should you do if it doesn't find the fields? The, 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 the happy pass is simple, but there is some stuff to be added to make it a robust solution. But that's like with any automation. So we got the fields, we got that. Now let's just wire them up. Say so that is email. So we'll take out that email text box here. And just drag email from here to here. That will be a set of ugly lines, but that's okay. <laughs> Last name. You, we, we can spend some hours in fixing the UI, uh, the making a nice looking flow. But phone number, it's this one. Phone. Company name. It's this one. Company. Role. And you see how easy it actually is just to wire things up. And I missed two fields that are somewhere in the back there, aren't they? Yes. The first one is somewhere in here. <laughs> You're I'm... making it prettier every time. Yeah, I, I'm not here to get a beauty contest today, are we? <laughs> get it done. <laughs> first name it was. And we had one more, I believe, back there somewhere. Yep. Address. Going back address so we got them all in here all we need to do now is in our main routine where we already have our excel parsed we drag the new activity just like this connect the dots and ideally i'll open excel quickly so we know which field is actually what since i don't remember in which sequence they are in the excel i'll have a quick look at that to know how to wire them up come on excel show there we go so it's first name, last name, company. That should then be first name. Last name, last company. Name, company. I think it was address. Was it address? Okay. You're good. First name, company. No, it was role. Oh, role. Huh. Role, then address. Okay, let's roll take that one. Email. Roll. Get that one. No, that was the wrong one. That one is a role. Now you are role and you are address. Then email. And then we and have then email and phone, I guess. Yeah, email and phone. Put email in here, phone in here, and that's us. We're done. Obviously, to prove a point, let's run the whole automation. Just go run. We'll open up Excel. You see Excel popping up quickly, getting the data, and now it starts populating the values. Oh, we got our breakpoint still. Hey, okay. Uh, remove breakpoint, continue, and go disappear. And you can see the magic working. No matter how the fields are sorted, the robot will find it. And Look at that. Wow. Isn't that fascinating? Looking how a robot does the work that we are supposed to be doing. And with an ever-changing screen, and it's solving an RPA challenge that's actually live. That's awesome. Yeah. That is really the whole magic of Universal Recorder and Universal Connector, right? And you can do with that. Awesome. Up. Let me go. I guess I don't need a slide. Well, they, on the slides, and maybe we share them. Well, I should share that probably. Uh, where's my screen share button? I apologize for going forth and back here. So for My Universal face appeared Recorder. on the screen suddenly, and I didn't. I wasn't expecting it. <laughs> so 
for the Universal Recorder, there is a knowledge base article there with some limitations out of the Utah release, right? It's the first release of the Universal Recorder. So there are some things it just doesn't capture quite right. We're working on that for version two. Um, if you want to use it, have a look at that knowledge base article. It's helpful to know what it can do and what it cannot do. Um, yeah, there's a link to product documentation for the connectors and how you record things. These are the new features there out in Utah. Really, really powerful stuff for your RPE developers. And what's the demo? Robot Calendar is another feature I wanted to spend a very briefly on. So if you have your unattended robots, they're running somewhere in a data center, you probably have a virtual VDI desktop somewhere that the robot is running on. You want to maximize the utilization of that robot, right? You, you might have processes that run on a scheduled basis. You see a screenshot here of like stuff where, where things run at middle of the night or different times of a day. Up to now, you'd schedule that. You probably had an Excel sheet somewhere flying around because you don't want to have overlapping things. Now we can actually show that, uh, visualize these schedules. And I can show that as well if I go to another screen share. Up, click, click in and out. What's that? It's a bit in and out. I'm sorry for that. Uh, it's fine with me. Here we go. That's my virtual machine again. If I go into the instance, which I should have open here, I hope. Yeah, here we go. So all I need to do to get to that calendar is I go to robotic RPA hub. If I can type that. Ropa, Ropa, who's Ropa? RPA hub. There we go. That's the central endpoint for everything RPA. Let's see if my session expired. You can see I am on a PDI instance, the def whatever 1037 something. It's a standard PDI instance, has the same speed like every one of yours. Um, and it has RPA hub loaded. Also the desktop design studio was linked or is linked to the same instance here. It's loading right there, come on. Live demo. Live power. What happened? Refresh. I'm always the one not patient enough for stuff to load. You know such persons? Come on. There we go. There Getting there. There we go. So what we can do, we go to the menu here of the different entries. We go to our robot. I have one robot here. It's my VM. Wow. And on that one, I currently have one process scheduled, but something just to want to show how that works. Um, so that's the robot page. You get some details any moment. We can see which processes are linked on that. There's a, see, I put just one process in there for the sake of the demo. And I have here a button called Robot Calendar, which opens that new calendar view, which by default filters out all records, only productive records, so released ones. That's one now get also the stuff we are building in. We apply that, so we have different filter options. And there you can see it's a calendar popping up with like, what is that robot doing and when? Is that especially Thanks. helpful if you want to maximize the utilization of your robots to see really what they're doing, when are they doing certain things? Um, and it, it spans that out over the next weeks. You have different options to view that, like you have here, uh, can select different dates, right? Move there and stuff like that. You can have a weekly, monthly view and stuff like that. So it's like an outlook view, kind of what of your robots are doing. Very helpful for planning and maintaining your robots. It's the DevOps side of creating these robots. Yeah, absolutely. Making sure that they're all alive, right? Um, now I'll need to go back to the slides because that is the last part that I wanted to show is reparenting. Reparenting is something that's hard to show on the thing because it actually is about tables, right, and stuff. But it is a very important topic. So. Reparenting, what does we, what do we mean by that? We had quite a lot of tables or RPA Hub comes with a lot of tables and structures. And quite frankly, some of them should probably have been updated relevant from the first place, but they were not. So what we did is we didn't delete these tables and re recreate them from scratch. Scratch. We actually reparenting them. So we're moving in the table hierarchy to make sure that they are captured as part of update sets, technically speaking, they are now extending the table called sys metadata. And that way, content is captured in update sets. So we can move that through along. 
get you some more details. These are the tables we have changed. You see there are eight of them, packages, package version, parameters, work queues, process queues and parameters. So all these kind of things have been moved to be update set relevant. And that's great. That's that makes life a lot easier. Mm -hmm. Things we could not move easily is actually a bot process. And if you work with RPA before, bot process is the central element where we store what process is executed, when is it executed, which machine is running on that. So there's a lot of information stored in that. And we couldn't reparent it easily because it's a CI record. We want to have it as a CI. We want to show it into the dependency view. We want to link it to application. So it has to be CI. So that record itself is still a CI and remains a CI. However, we have moved off all the configuration data from that CI into what we call now a bot process configuration. That way we still can transfer all the configuration data and the CI is still the one that you have to create on each device or in each instance separately. But all the configuration elements, they have been moved to a separate table called bot process configuration. And why are we actually doing that? If you worked with RPA and maybe you created your flows, for example, right? Things in the platform that reference elements out of RPA Hub, like a process or a work queue. If they don't move with update sets, but the referencing element, in this case flows, they move with update sets, they're suddenly not in sync. You, you transfer your flow and it reaches the target environment and the queue field is empty because the sysids don't match. That is painful. So you have to either manually modify the flow in the past or transfer the, the record via sysid, we export, export XML, import XML, and that has been alleviated now. So they will stay. And with reparenting, there's no need to change or update any of your existing flows because the sysids you currently have, they're still the same, which is repointing the tables. So that is why we did it. it, makes it a lot simpler. But how do we do that? The, the important part here is as part of your upgrade, we will need to modify the data underneath, right? We will repoint the tables. We move infos from the bot process to bot process configuration. So there's a lot of stuff happening during the upgrade. If you come from San Diego or Tokyo, moving into Utah and you had RPA on before that. So there's a migration process happening. We do recommend before and after that upgrade. And that's why there's a big, ugly, nasty red slide here. Oh my. Before you go into Utah, and I think that's the first time I have seen things like that in the ServiceNow ecosystem, right? Before you go to upgrade to Utah, if you have been using RPA, you have to set the property. And that property is called Glide, Rollback, Blacklist, Table, Parent, Change, Dot, Change. You have to set this one to false. Otherwise, the migration will not touch your RPA stuff. It will not upgrade the structures. So set that property, run the upgrade, and once you're done, set it back to true because the default value is true. So you need to actually do that manually before you upgrade and after the upgrade. If you happen to miss that step, you'll need to contact our support so they can help you do a post upgrade manual change of that. We can run a script, we can fix that after the fact, but ideally you set that property first, run your upgrade and reset the property. There is a knowledge base article linked at the bottom here that explains the whole process and also what is happening, which data is moving from left to right and where and stuff like that. So you find your way around. But I put that explicitly right here because that's an important step as you go through an upgrade to Utah. Enough about warning. I think that's pretty much all I wanted to show as part of today's Creator Toolbox. Any questions, anything you want me to cover? Uh, we had more um, general overview questions of ideas like, uh, what do you think would be the easiest way to say what is the advantage of RPA in ServiceNow versus RPA um, on other platforms? Inside the chat, we some of us talked about how it being all on one platform, your data, your normal automations with APIs and stuff like that, or integration hub, uh, and then RPA on top of it. And then having all of that in one platform is already a huge thing. Um, what else would you want to say to that, Daniel? Well, the big benefit that we can have with platform as a kind of the back end for the RPA technology is really that we can can breach silos or bring silos down of different entities, right? We, we can use CMDB information. We know when you update a platform like your ERP system and we know which robots are actually using that. So we can pre, uh, proactively 
make sure that these robots get updated as well if they need to be. So we have that view on that. And we also can use if a robot fails, it's so easy to raise an incident in the ServiceNow platform. It is within the same platform. We know the events happening and we can push that back and trigger all the necessary remediation tasks and things like that. So that that is the big benefit of having it integrated in, in, in a platform like ServiceNow. Nice. Oh, we had another question. Uh, do you have a timeline for when the in in the in platform version of the studio will be available? <laughs> a good question. The desktop design studio that, that I also shared on, on my virtual Windows machine here. So yes, we have that as a backlog item, but to be fairly honest, it has not a high priority at the moment. And the reason for that is by just moving that into in platform, we don't have new features, right? We are more keen to get you new features, new functionalities out there. Also the shift from the desktop to the browser-based version is probably a big rock because currently it is a completely .NET framework application and there is no right. native .NET in the browser, right? So yes, it is on the backlog. We are experimenting and trying out. If, if we have a breakthrough, an easy one, then you might see it earlier. But in terms of priorities, fairly honest, it is on the lower end. Of course. Uh, speaking of forward-looking kind of things, what else do you think we could be looking forward to um, or prepping for in the future? Oh, you asked me for about road mapping. <laughs> I do have a roadmap slide, but I didn't prepare to share that. So yes, there's exciting things coming. We already mentioned the recorder will get a new version in uh, uh, Vancouver. Just getting my alphabet right. Um, <laughs> what else do we have on that? I would need to look up that roadmap. If you give me a few minutes, I can pull it out. But that is, I didn't have it here. <laughs> if it is only a simple single step to if it's only a single step to upgrade all the RPAs, why is it not added to the upgrade steps itself? You're talking probably around that property change in before and after uh, the, in that question. Um, yes, point taken. I, I got that knowledge article pretty late when we are already in, in the rollout of the release. Um, point taken. Uh, that's Here's another... Um straightforward question is there any there is bot management uh so specific number of bots that can run could sit, run the same job with multiple instances to increase the throughput um i think that's one of the big reasons why you have the robot calendar now too is to make sure your <laughs> robots aren't colliding uh to make yeah. sure they can run multiple processes if they're splitting up work all that Absolutely. kind of stuff but so yeah, you can yeah. use the same robot to run multiple processes, just one at a time. That's why we need that robot calendar to know when the robot is executing what, right? But you can also have multiple robots running the same process for throughput, right? If you have really a high workload attitude, yes. you do. Oh, yeah, that's talking about roadmap. You want to put that safe harbor button down there. <laughs> <laughs> we will. We are working on automatically starting and stopping the robot machines as needed, right? So really just fire them up, virtual machines, and stop them when we don't need them to save you costs. So that's one of the harbor, safe harbor outlooking statements, yes. Yeah, and uh, multiple robots hitting the same queue is definitely possible. Absolutely, yes. You can do that as, as, as much as you want. There's no limitation besides the license um, on, on how many robots can work on a given queue. Or how many virtual machines you can spin up at a time. Correct. <laughs> <laughs> That's not usually the limiting factor, though. <laughs> yeah. Can the recorder work on any Windows program like Work PDF, etc.? So technically, yes, it finds any Windows program that's running on the machine. Um, refer to that KB I mentioned with the limitations, some things like a file dialog, file open close, I think currently has an issue that should be sorted hopefully soon. Um, for like Excel, for example, we have an extra connector with specific methods. You can use the recorder to read files from Excel, right? You, you can hover over the individual cells and it will tell you read cell A1, A, A2, A3. You can do that if you want, but using the Excel connector, it's much easier. You see, I, I had much one easier. component, read table, whoop, and I have the whole table in memory. I don't need to get cell by cell by cell. But yes, you can use the recorder for the same thing as an example, yes. If you like paying, you can do it that way. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I could have done that, right? Reading field by field. What was that? Eight records, <laughs> seven columns. Okay. 
or that one time I tried to do it with screenshots instead of by HTML selectors. <laughs> yeah. And then you still have that UI control piece, right? If, if, if you had, don't have a connector, if it doesn't find elements, you can work with uh, computer vision and use screenshots to do that. Absolutely. Um, I also, I mean, I used it on uh, Alexa app mm -hmm. one time. I used it on, you can make it open any form of IDE. I had that open. So it works on pretty much anything on your Windows machine. Um, but it's easier if it has HTML or some something from the universe. The composable connector. UI that it basically can find elements on, right? Absolutely. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Something that meshes well with the .NET framework, basically. <laughs> well, or Java. Java applications work similarly. Not that common anymore, but they work similarly. Um, so there is a question, uh, does the recorder work on any integrations like REST API integrations? If you have a REST API integration, probably don't <laughs> just use <laughs> serve, just use the platform, the yeah, integration, integration hub, hub or um, any other method of reaching the REST API it will so be much that, faster. That's out. one of the differentiators to other RPA technologies out there, right? If, if you use something else, they need to have API capabilities in the robot. We don't. We have a platform that can do that. Mm -hmm. And even if you're in the robot and you want to utilize some of the integration of features, call a flow. Okay? It's invoke yep. flow and you can call a flow and just have ServiceNow do that for you and come back with a result into the robot. Much simpler to do than building it on the robot side of things. Mm -hmm. In one single flow, you can do your REST API calls and then initiate a robot process too from there. And good questions from the audience. Um, a lot of people are uh, basically voicing excitement for getting to try it now, especially in the PDIs. Um, we mentioned earlier that RPA, if you want to play with it, go to your plugins on your PDI and then search for RPA and then press the enable button and then go take a long break. <laughs> uh, and then come back to it, and then it'll have instructions on how to get it working, uh, how to get it installed on your machine, and then how to get it connected to your instance. It's um, it's a process. You want to make sure you follow the instructions that are provided inside there for you, because uh, uh, there it's 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 this is one of the first things that are within. If you're a ServiceNow developer, that you're installing something separately from your ServiceNow instance to make it work. Um, and so it's a little bit of a different process than a lot of people are used to. It's not hard though. It's just intimidating at first sight, uh, but it's easy to get it set up. Um, most of us were able to set it up really quickly, especially if you follow uh, labs or just even just the instructions that they provide. It's pretty sim straightforward and easy to do. Yeah, and uh, people have, I think there is an echo still, but uh, people have already installed mid servers in the past. That's also an external utility. So it's like that. And there's a blog that's coming up on this Thursday where I can go through the step-by-step -step information on how you can install the plugin and the text chart. Sweet. Um, Daniel, did you have any announcements or anything that anything you want to plug? Um, well, announcements might only be knowledge, right? If, it's, if we want to take a teaser, knowledge is coming up in May. I'll be there at knowledge. We will have a great RPA lab at knowledge. Uh, we'll have CreatorCon around there with, with lots of information around that, for sure. At last year's knowledge is when I tried to do, uh, I used uh, RPA Hub for Live Coding Happy Hour live at Knowledge. Um, yep. And everyone <laughs> got to see me wrestling with the community forums like, all live at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> Sweet. Um, Pranav, did you have any uh, other things to announce? No, I think that's good. Thank you very much, Daniel, for showing us all these things. And folks, this is just like uh, uh, one of the part of Utah release. So there are a lot more content about Utah. So you have, you can check devling.sn slash Utah. And uh, again, thank you very much, Daniel. And that's all I have. Thank all right, you all. Everyone. Have a great night Bye. or morning or day. Have a good day wherever you are. Bye-bye.